Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to a very, very special edition of the Cheats Movement Podcast. I'm your host, Cheats, and I'm joined by a phenomenal guest today, Greg Kreinler. Did I get it right? You got it. <laughs> I want to say it right. And if you're not familiar with Greg's work, uh, it is just phenomenal. He is one, he is a just an amazing, amazing artist, visual artist, painter. He does just phenomenal work, but he's actually developed over the last, geez, 20, 30 years now, uh, a, a career in making America's national pastime baseball and bringing historic baseball images and imagery to life through his paintings. It is phenomenal. Greg, welcome to the show. It is an honor to have you. Thank you for having me, Mark. It's an honor being here. The first thing I'm going to bring up is because we here at the Cheats Movement are huge, huge fans of hip hop and hip hop culture. Okay. You got a compliment from none other than <laughs> Chuck D. Chuck D said that you are one of the best artists he has ever seen in his life. Just a phenomenal artist. How did you feel when Chuck D, one of the icons of hip hop, said that you are one of his favorite artists and one of the best artists he's ever seen? Um, I didn't really know how to react because, you know, I was, I was listening to him, you know, when I was in high school and like the first thing, like I'm blown away. I don't know what to say in response to him, but I, I, I you know, I wanted to message him and just thank him for the shout out. And I'm like, how do I even address him? I mean, is it Mr. D? Mister, you know, is it Mr. D? Like, yeah. I, I, I mean, <laughs> dear legend yeah heavy rhymer like it's like i don't know uh, have you have you ever been able to interact with chuck D? did you message him yeah yeah i did and we've, okay. we've uh we've exchanged a few uh messages here and there and i'm like i can't believe i'm talking to chuck d that I, is amazing i can't believe it i mean that is amazing <laughs> so yeah it blew my mind and the fact that you know the fact that he seems to like what i do and is somehow like affected by it uh, positively that I, I got nothing. That's awesome. That's <laughs> all. I, I came across that and I said, I've got to lead with that. I only have one Chuck D story ever. Chuck D um, several years ago, and I'm, I'm sure he does it now, did a lecture tour through college campuses. And I was long graduated from college, but he came to the University of Richmond. I'll never forget. And I got invited to kind of sit in this round table before he does like the big lecture, right? Right. And so I think we had like an hour with about 10 people sitting around this table. And I'll never forget. I don't even know what the question was, but the first person was like, Oh, you know, you got a question for Chuck Lee. And everybody was supposed to go around the room and ask a question. Uh, the person asked question number one, Chuck D spoke for the next 58 minutes awesome. <laughs> about like, and it was amazing. Like it was like jaw dropping, like before he had to give like another two hour lecture. But he, it was something about culture, and he was just, he was gone. And I, we just sat there in awe, and he's just a phenomenal, phenomenal, uh, obviously, musician and artist, but he's just a phenomenal person to ever be in a, in a room with or have a conversation with. It's, that's phenomenal. Yeah, well, what's funny is, you know, we, we were talking about the, the New Orleans Baseball Museum before. When I, when I had gone there last year and I, I met uh, Bob Kendrick, the director, for the first mm -hmm. time, you know, I, I love Bob. He's like the coolest guy in the world. And I, I was telling people when I talk about Bob, I'm like, he's the best hype man since Flava Flav. And, and I'm like, <laughs> and I'm talking to Chuck D. Like, right, that's what, awesome. what, what world is this? <laughs> that's awesome. Well, let's, let's talk about that because that's one of the things that I ran across in the, in the long Canyon of your work, but you've spent four years on one particular project that, it was Negro League focused, and that and that's a, a big part of why I want to talk to you uh, during this interview is because we just finished the centennial kind of pageantry of a hundred years of the Negro Leagues in 2020. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic, even a lot of the cool stuff they got, you know, they had planned. The museum had to be shut down for a while. Baseball wasn't the same. It wasn't able to honor kind of that centennial the way that I think they would have if everybody was paying attention in stadiums across the country on, right. on the field. But you have spent four years on a project that started with a, a suggestion of 15 to 20 paintings. 
Yeah. <laughs> what did it end up? <laughs> I mean, the the final total when all was said and done was 230. Oh, that's amazing. But there's sm- I mean, they're 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 five by seven. So like in terms of uh, you know size relationship to the normal stuff I do, they're small. But oh man, you know, it's like I got to know all of those men and women, you know, kind of like intimately and painting each not each and every one of them, but I'm painting so many of them. Uh, man, it's like, that's like a career and life highlight to get a project like that. So how did the project come about for you? And then how did it kind of keep increasing in scale and scope? And, and how did you kind of take the, when you started, I'm sure you didn't think it was going to be four years. No, no, not at all. I mean, the, so the guy, the guy who commissioned the work, uh, who commissioned the paintings. He's a, a collector who uh, lives out in Seattle. And he, uh, you know, he collects like memorabilia and, and baseball cards and things like that. And uh, I had met him through a mutual friend uh, and he is very big into the Negro Leagues and he's very big into his collection of Negro League stuff and civil rights stuff. Uh, and he kind of, he approached me and he, you know, had seen my work and I guess knew about me and he's like, okay, well, you know, I, I, I really like what you do. And, you know, I'd love to maybe commission you to do, uh, you know, maybe 10 or 15 paintings of some of my favorite players, uh, some of my favorite Negro leaders. And, you know, I'm thinking, cool, that's awesome. You know, I never really get to paint Negro leaguers. You know, I painted uh, painted Josh Gibson like once at the time, yes. you know, and I, I hadn't painted Satchel or Cool Papa Bell or any of the, the luminaries. Uh, so yeah, we, we kind of, we went back and forth a little bit and he, we stopped talking for a while, like before anything was kind of concrete. And I, you know, I didn't understand exactly what was, uh, what was going on and like where the project stood. So I kind of thought it was just gonna, uh, you know, just kind of fall apart because that happens a lot. Uh, But he came back and he's like, all right, so I have this idea, Uh, you know, in in 2020, uh, the the Negro League, uh, the Negro National League is going to be celebrating its 100th, you know, anniversary of Mm -hmm. formation. Um, I, you know, I have a lot of artifacts and I would love to try to put together a show, uh, an exhibit uh, that contains the artifacts and also your paintings and some uh, paintings by other, uh, by other artists. So how would you feel about, you know, maybe doing more? Uh, and, you know, I, sure, absolutely. Uh, you know, what are you, what are you thinking? Like, you know, maybe maybe 40, 50. Oh, great. That's awesome. You know, let's, let's make this happen. So as time went on, you know, the project kind of started and, you know, he was like, okay, this is happening. I'm going to pay you. And, and, you know, this is kind of what I'm hoping to get done and, and what I'm hoping to kind of get out of this, uh, out of this exhibit and, you know, what I'm trying to like kind of get across to people. Uh, and the scope of it just kind of kept getting bigger. So, you know, he ended up talking to, to Bob Kendrick at, at the mm-hmm. museum. And uh, I guess basically they, you know, they were going to have some sort of celebration, some sort of celebration of the centennial. And uh, this collector was going to be involved. Like he, his show was going to kind of kick off that year for the museum. So all of a sudden, you know, he's like, okay, so we're going to do this and I'm going to need more than, you know, 40 or 50 paintings because there, <laughs> there are so many people that I want to represent, you know, that I want to kind of have in this show. So, you know, 50 paintings becomes uh, 75 and 75 becomes 100. And, you know, I, it's, it just, it keeps growing and growing and growing and growing until you know, I, I have literally like a month or two before the show opens in, in February of 2020, I'm finishing up, you know, like the last two portraits and it's, you know, actually like going there to Kansas City and, and actually seeing like four years worth of work on the wall. 
in that many paintings, I mean, it was, it was crazy. <laughs> and, and, and let me be clear because I, it, it varies, but the reputation of your, not only your work, but the reputation of your backlog, it's like to get commissioned work, which you have done, it's, it's year. It's like years in the backlog. Yeah. And so to be able to kind of put priority on this event and to continue to scale it, like, how did you even, in regards to time management, how are you even able to put that in? Was it just, hey, look, we're going to do this and it's, it's such a kind of worthy project? Yeah, I mean, I, so I had a, I had a pretty dense backlog of, of commission stuff that I had to finish or, you know, that I was hoping to finish. Right. Uh, <laughs> and it had kind of already become a little bit complicated with the birth of my two sons. Uh, so... I, you know, I kind of talked to a few of the collectors and they were very supportive because right, I think right. they kind of realized that, you know, it was a very important project, not only, you know, to me, but, but in the grand scale of, of, of baseball, uh, you know, if, if I can say that. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, I just, I, I tunnel visioned, I, I worked on, uh, some other stuff when I could, but for the most part, I was just, I was churning out these, these, what I call uh, their color studies. They're basically just kind of uh, portrait, like head and shoulder shots of, of all these, all these players. And yeah. <laughs> the, the interesting thing, especially about the way you go about your work as well, it's, it's, uh, you know, you're really into the detail and the essence of, the subject matter, the scenery, especially if it's a it's a big stadium shot or a background. Right. When you're doing a project like this, how much did you actually learn about the the players that you are doing portraits of and their backstories? Is there any any particular ones that stand out outside of the norm? Uh, I mean, so I, I learned a lot. Uh, like blanket statement when when you know the guy gave me the list of players that he wanted me to paint you know like let's say the final list of 200 whatever uh <laughs> i i i knew i knew like maybe 10 percent of the players sure like I, I i knew about them and had heard maybe those names of like some of those 10 percenters 90 percent totally new to me i it's it's just amazing because you know, these players who, uh, who were, I mean, for, you know, lack of a, of a better phrase, they're kind of like swept under the rug of, of baseball history. And, and me just kind of like learning about them, whether they were the Negro leaguers or like the, the, you know, the players in Latin America, it was like learning each individual story about the player, how they kind of came up uh, you know, learning about the teams that they were on, learning about uh, learning about how great players they were. It kind of paled in comparison to, uh, not to sound corny or trite or cliche, but it, it paled wow. in comparison to what I kind of learned about myself and kind of how I uh, how I wanted to approach the project. Um, if that makes sense, it's sure. It's 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 kind of a it's it's an interesting thing because i i'm you know i'm a white male and you know, middle class you know i could never begin to uh begin to imagine what it was like to be you know an african american in this country certainly you know, in that era, in whether it's, you know, the fifties the or the twenties or going back to the 19th sure. century, you know, what it's like to be an African-American professionally, socially, uh, uh, you know, personally, economically, like I, I could never understand that. Um, so what I wanted to do was try to just bring these players back to life uh, in a way that was portraying them as honestly as possible. So I kind of wanted to make sure, I mean, I, I always try to make sure that I'm, you know, historically accurate with whatever it is that I'm painting. I get really anal about it. Yeah, as you say, you have a, it's, 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 your reputation precedes you and 
right. You, you know, you'll sit certain things down for months at a time just to make sure that you have lettering or colors or something right. as authentic as possible, right? Yeah, and and it was just like that with with these portraits, and uh, it was it was a lot harder to do the research uh, because there are definitely fewer resources available sure. to kind of comb through, but you know, it was the intention to just kind of present them honestly to people and let them kind of bring whatever it is that they bring to these paintings, you know, themselves. So it's not, you know, it's not my opinion of what it was like to be, you know, black in this country ever. It's, it's just the presentation of, of the person. No, that's, it's, it's a phenomenal body of work and it's, I, I want to, make sure I have it correct because I know that there was an exhibit in the museum but I also saw um, and I've purchased just as recently as this week the baseball card set that oh that you did you. as well oh no it's 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 a piece that I would definitely love to have are they are they one in the same or is it yeah okay yeah so they're they're the same uh, the the baseball card set uh, is I think about a hundred and 84 cards yeah. so it doesn't have the entire 230 because there were some players that we uh, we just couldn't get the uh, the licenses to to make you know products sure. of um, but you know the best thing about this set I think and like any of the products that, that Jay the the guy behind this uh, the best thing about what he's put out is that he's doing it the right way and that he involves the museum you know portion of those proceeds go to the museum portion of the sure. proceeds go to the players families you know so you know he's not like he's not just some guy who's just like taking advantage of of yeah no it, it seems like the museum has been lockstep the entire process yeah. in regards to making this into a reality and, and you're exactly right in regards to um reference points and kind of historical tales of what it was like in the Negro Leagues and how it all came together. Um, I've read probably two <laughs> two baseball books on the Negro Leagues and it might there might be 10 out. There's a little bit more now. Yeah, there's more up, now. Yeah. Up until probably, you know, 1990 something, there was there was only a handful of resources that right. would kind of tell these stories and and you know, in accuracy things change. So it, it's it's just kind of phenomenal to learn about the fact that I think even most people without being on the surface would hear the word Negro Leagues and think that it was just like one league like right they would think that it's like you know the American League or the National League and stuff like that it's you know it's a combination of eight different leagues through all these you know periods of time and and Rube Foster and those guys uh, ultimately I think it was 1920 or something bought it bought it together and again the way that your imagery in regards to this particular subject matter, like you said, ha that hasn't been um, highly, like even just now we're starting to see things like Major League Baseball recognize stats, right, right. of right. Um, players that played in the Negro Leagues. And, you, you know, you saw a lot of kind of uh, grandfathering into the Hall of Fame, but, you know, they, they, they a lot of players just passed away before they ever got their due and their recognition. And so what you've done in many ways is just – brought to life for so many people so many names and faces and families that would not have been recognized any other way like 204 again 240 some <laughs> again the most people can name on a good day that's done a lot of research can name maybe 35 <laughs> to 40 players you know that, and those are the those are the experts those are, right right <laughs> you, are, you are now by default uh it, it, and that's another thing I'll ask you about. It doesn't necessarily just apply to your Negro Leagues project, but by doing the work that you've done, and you've done it for for quite some time professionally. I, I don't, uh, I don't. I'll ask you how how it all started, but you've become a baseball historian in many ways. Yeah. Um, on a level that a lot of folks, even just through work on a, uh, in, in knowing the images and stadiums and pictures that a lot of people that may not be associated with. Now, did that happen by default or was that something when you were going through this, you're like, at some point you're like, you know what, I'm probably going to know more about baseball than the average person. <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, <laughs> I, it was, it was kind of both because I think when I started doing the baseball paintings, I was very conscious, at least of the fact that, 
that baseball fans are really anal, you know, about the history, <laughs> sure. which is great because I'm really <laughs> anal. Um, I, I, I think, you know, I like to, I like to say, you know, on my good days that I'm like a, a visual historian of some sort, but I still think that the majority of the stuff in my head, you know, to 99.9% .9 of this population on earth, it's completely useless and pointless. <laughs> but to me, it's like, you know, it, it's gold, you know, I, it's like, I can, I can think of I can think of what Yankee Stadium, you know, looked like in 1937 and how it differed uh, by how it looked in 1936 and then in 1935. But, you know, when my son, who's like really into numbers or whatever, he's talking about long division already. And I'm like, I got nothing, kid. I, <laughs> this is not my area. I, sure. Yeah, I I can't help you. <laughs> That's all. You want to know about you know the the New York Giants jersey in 1905? I can help you with that, but yeah. <laughs> now you you do do contemporary uh, you know work if if the time comes. Most of it is historic. So do you when it comes to like your 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 boys are younger now, but I, I, like in regards to even doing research. Is it like a great excuse to tell your wife, like, hey, I've got to hit five stadiums this year? Like, <laughs> or or is it or is it like you just gotta go back in the books and be like, I'm pretty much in 1940, you know, 49 as opposed to 2021? Yeah, well, it's it's funny because it's again, it's it's a little bit of both because I I'm not going to see any more baseball than than the average person. I'm, I'm probably actually seeing less than the average person. Sure. Uh, when I do modern stuff, especially it's, I don't want to say that it's easier to paint it, but uh, it's not the same kind of research that goes into it. Uh, and that's, you know, that's basically just a, a byproduct of the fact that, you know, you can watch a baseball game and see every pitch from 30 different angles, you know, in color, HD, you know, 3D or whatever. Uh, and, you know, if you go back to the 30s or 40s or whatever, you're, you're pretty limited. To, mm. to what you're going to find, whether it's photography, whether it's color, whether it's, you know, what people are saying in the newspapers. Um, so, yeah, I mean, sometimes, sometimes I, I, you know, have to kind of uh, really plug in and, and go back to, you know, 1910 or whatever and, and just live there for a while and try to come up with whatever <laughs> answers I need to the particular problem. Uh, but so, it's you know it's fun. When did it when did it start for you? Now I know you grew up uh, as as a baseball fan, but when did it start in in regards to this passion for uh, you know, painting baseball players? And also, when did was it just a kind of one in the same? You had a passion for baseball, and this is what you were drawing, or how, how did it come about? And then when did you realize like, oh, this is going to be a career? Well, so I. I start, I've been drawing since I was, uh, since I was, you know, really little, probably, you know, four or five or whatever. Um, and I, what I was drawing at the time, uh, I was drawing kind of like the cartoons that I was watching, you know, drawings of the cartoons that I was watching. So like He-Man, G.I. Joe, Thundercats, people in those cartoons, that's what I was kind of focused on. Uh, and at some point, you know, probably when I was, I don't know, six or seven or something like that, I discovered uh, what was left of my father's baseball co uh, card collection. And, you know, at the time, it's like I was a baseball fan. I was born into like a Yankee family, uh, <laughs> which is still, I still find it kind of weird because my dad, you know, is a huge Yankee fan. And my mother's actually a Brooklyn Dodgers fan. So I don't know how they've been together for almost 50 years, but, but anyway, um, that's great. That's great. <laughs> so, you know, she, I, I was going to say, did she go to Los Angeles? To, like, is, no, in her, no. In her fandom, when they left Brooklyn, was she? No. It was, it was over. It, 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 yeah, I mean, it's like in her in her head, you know, she could still go to Ebbets Field, you know, right, like okay. right now. Okay. Um, yeah, she never transferred the allegiance, but... Uh, I get it, I get it. Uh, I, you know, I was going to games since I was a little kid, so I was conscious of of the game itself. But seeing my, my father's baseball card collection, seeing the players that he grew up with, that, that he kind of idolized, uh, you know, Mickey Mantle and, and 
Whitey Ford and Elston Howard and, and Hector Lopez, people like that, uh, seeing these cards of them, I knew that they, they had value, not necessarily intrinsic value, but kind of, you know, sentimentality. And what I think happened was since those cards, a lot of them from the, uh, from the late 40s and early 50s were actually illustrated. So they were like paintings and, and drawings rather than just photography. So I think in my head, I was kind of like, well, I draw and the people who made these cards draw, you know, I could draw Mickey Mantle just like they can draw Mickey Mantle. I mean, not as good, but, but I can do that too. And I think, I think something kind of went off in my head where I, I realized that I could do that, not necessarily, you know, as a, as a career or anything, but just something that I could do that I knew that my father would enjoy, um, you know, drawing a picture of Mickey Mantle for him, uh, you know, given by his five-year-old son or six-year-old son or whatever, I figured he would lose his mind. Or maybe, maybe I'm just thinking about that right now. I, was gonna say, as a, <laughs> I don't know what I was a, thinking then. No, I was going to say, as a father of a six-year-old, if, if Cam came today with a picture of like Griffey Jr., I'd be like, that's the coolest thing ever. So, yeah, basically. It's like, how do you top that? <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd be, I get it. I, it works. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, so I, I continued kind of drawing uh, and I, you know, I was still like a baseball fan, but I kind of, I, I got into my teens, uh, you know, went through puberty and got weird, uh, you know, started, you know, paying more attention to like comic books and, and girls, uh, even though they wouldn't pay attention to me. Um, <laughs> but I was like more into that. And I, you know, I was always just drawing, not so much painting, but drawing. And I ended up, uh, going to the School of Visual Arts, which is a, it's a private art school in Manhattan. Uh, and my intent at the time was that I was going to be an illustrator of like fantasy and science fiction book covers because not that I love the genre or anything. I didn't, I wasn't really a reader, but the imagery of it, I had kind of always been attracted to. Um, and at that point I hadn't really done anything baseball art related uh in a long time but uh you know I, I was kind of like learning how to do that in college and I started floundering because I realized that it wasn't really for me uh it didn't didn't like tug on my heartstrings like I thought that it should uh so I kind of ended up you know their senior year and I'm in my portfolio class and the professor who would kind of just give, you know, these, these general uh, themed assignments so that each student would kind of take it wherever he or she wanted to go. Uh, he assigned uh, the project of us illustrating a relationship. And for whatever reason, like one of the first things that came to my mind was the relationship between a, a pitcher and a batter. And when I got like a little bit uh, more carried away with that idea, I, it's like I went back to being a kid again and I was like, okay, why don't I do a painting of Mickey Mantle from my dad? And that was when I kind of realized that I was, uh, you know, going to be painting something that people were going to be kind of anal about because, you know, it's like Mickey Mantle had to look like Mickey Mantle and, you know, whatever ballpark he was in had to look like that specific ballpark. So I, I, you know, I got into it, I, I researched, I worked my butt off and I made a, you know, at the time, what I thought was a, a nice painting and <laughs> I really, really enjoyed it. And, okay. And I think I was like, maybe there's something to this. And it kind of took, it took a while. It took a few years of, you know, being in my early to mid twenties of, you know, that vast wasteland of, of not knowing what you're going to do with your life. Oh, uh, oh, AKA awesomeness. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> true. <laughs> like, AKA freedom. No, I'm joking, yeah. I'm joking, I'm joking, oh, I'm oh, freedom. <laughs> In some um, ways. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I started doing more of those, of those mm. baseball paintings. And I was like, yeah, this is something about this feels really good. And eventually I was, I was really lucky in that um, my work got like a little bit of, of press, like a really, mm -hmm. really good press. 
and it kind of opened up the world for me where people were becoming familiar with my work and, and wanting to commission me to do stuff. And, you know, it's now, now, you know, painting is, painting is really hard and I really try to, you know, bust my butt with it and, and, and push myself as much as possible. But still to this day, it's like, it's, it's playing with, for me, it's just like, it's something that I love doing and it's something that I get to, you know, that I get to enjoy. And the fact that I'm able to do that, I'm just, it's, I'm beyond lucky. I, it's unbelievably lucky. And Ladies, I never take that for granted. Ladies and gentlemen, the voice you are hearing is Greg Kreindler. He is a, an amazing, amazing artist that is probably one of, I uh, look, uh, he's a very humble man. I'm, I'm learning this as I speak to him, <laughs> but he is probably one of the most, uh, world-renowned living baseball artist historians oh, that there is right now and he's just his work phenomenal will overlay quite a bit of it um while we're doing this interview because it is uh stuff that you have to see and you have to follow his social medias as well because uh either it's on twitter or instagram he puts up so just phenomenal work that make that stops you in your tracks um before we get you out of here let me ask uh, a couple of kind of a couple of rapid fire questions if you will yeah. Um, do it. Do you have a favorite baseball stadium? Um, a favorite one that I that I like painting, or a favorite one that I'd like to go to. I like to uh, I like to leave it open because you know I feel like you live with some of these stadiums that we may not be able to see now. But, I do. So so now, do you have like when you're looking at us? Is there a stadium that comes to mind that's either you wish you'd been there or you just love going to? Yeah. It both uh the problem is and i'm sorry this is not very rapid fire because (laughs) brevity is just not my thing it's fun it's fun (laughs) but uh the polo grounds uh ebbets field and old yankee stadium all the reason i mean i've been to yankee stadium plenty of times but not you know not the pre-renovated yankee stadium that my father went to reason reason being that i would love to go to these is because you know i would love to be sitting in the stands, you know, with my father as a kid at Yankee Stadium, or my grandfather at the Polo Grounds, or my other grandfather at, at Ebbets Field. Uh, and I think they're just all, the three of those of those ballparks are so unique and so different from each other, yet they're all New York ballparks. Sure. Uh, there's just something very cool about that. Um, but I would love to go to, I mean, you know, Sportsman's Park would be great. Um, Shy would be great. Any of those places. You'd have to sell me on the polo grounds. I'm a, I'm a maze guy. And so I read, I read a lot about maze and reading about what the polo grounds was, especially in center field. It's just like right. apparently goes on for miles and allows, and it's just, it didn't, it didn't seem like a stadium that I would like to sit and watch a game at. It just seems like it would be very difficult, but I've, uh, obviously Yankee Stadium is Yankee Stadium and, and Ebbets Field has so much lore to it but the Polo Grounds seemed like they were definitely living in shabble conditions there for a while yeah yeah and it I mean part of that like part of that is what makes it appealing to me you know or like, the charm of <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the fact that like you know you could hit a ball two hundred and seventy feet into right field and it's a home run, but if you hit one four hundred and eighty feet <laughs> yeah. to center gonna, field, Maze is gonna catch it. Yeah, he's gonna catch it. It's like, <laughs> what, what are you doing? <laughs> um, I, I'm assuming it's gonna be the Yankees, but did you did you have like not just like a, a team like the team that you follow, but like a favorite particular team, like a year and a team that's like. Oh man, that's a, such a great, great team. All right. I'm going to get myself in trouble here. Um, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> all right. So I, you know, like I said, I, I, I grew up a Yankee fan into a Yankee family. Uh, and I love, you know, all of the old teams. Uh, I find myself like, as I get older, I'm not drifting away from the Yankees at all. I still love them. And, you know, they're still a part of my heart and everything, but the kind of baseball that I think I like watching more that excites me more is more national league ball. Um, you know, that's kind of like, it seems like national league ball for the most part is, is more about, uh, more of like a mind game and a small ball kind of thing. I mean, you know, sure they're power hitters and everything, but it's, 
it just seems a bit more intense mm-hmm. where whereas you know the yankees i feel like their philosophy is kind of always uh you know get one or two guys on base and then you know get godzilla to the place to the plate and have him hit a home <laughs> run uh which is fine but i yeah i don't know i i I find myself sometimes watching the Mets, you know, or listening to the Mets or reading about them and being like, that sounds like a fun team. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) absolutely. The, when you would say, when you just describe kind of the, the different levels, I I, like some of the national league teams in the eighties were just so like the whole, like the whole thing was such mind games with uh, you know, if you're looking at some of the Cardinal teams in the eighties or something like that, it's like, you know, base deal like base dealing in some ways is a lost art, and, yeah. and like in, in this in this game, you know what I mean, in like the twenty twenty one game. So I, I look back at some of that, uh, some of those teams when you say that, and you just think of the strategies and so forth. Um, we are big product guys uh, on on the cheats movement. We love products that kind of might be out of the uh, out of the ordinary. We mentioned. Um, your Negro League project and even kind of transforming that to a baseball card collection. You've had years and years of doing uh, amazing commissioned work. Has anything you've done like turned into a a cool product where you were just like, not just a painting, but maybe something that you were like, man, that's really, that's different. That's really cool. Uh, The, that happened. So like, uh, it was about two years ago. uh, I was commissioned by uh, Tops, the baseball card company to, to do, uh, 20 paintings for one of their sets and it was the first time I got to see my artwork in on like a real not that you know not that the Negro League cards aren't real but uh, but seeing them on like a on a baseball card an actual baseball card that was really awesome uh, and cool. you know having my father see that like having my father get to hold a baseball card 20 baseball cards in his hands that his that I guess his son painted it, I don't know. It's like I could see, I could, I could see the pride, you know, in him when he talks about, sure. it. and it's amazing. And That's that was, really cool. That was cool. Now you, uh, it's, it's. I'm not speaking out of school because some of this stuff has been printed. Yeah. No. Do are you surprised at some of the prices that either your work sells for, or have been commissioned for, or resold for? Um, you know, anywhere from fifty-five to eighty thousand dollars, or stuff like like. Do you look at that and be like, "That's crazy. That's insane." I, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I honestly, at this, at this point, sometimes it's out of your hands, right? These are resellers or auctions or certain things too. So. Yeah, yeah. But you look but, at this and you're just like, "This is ridiculous." Yeah, I mean, like, so, like, right now, I'm, you know, I'm about. Uh, I think I've been telling people who you know, contact me wanting to commission something. I've been telling them it's about a, a five-year wait. <laughs> and, and I'm like, who the hell in their right mind wants to pay, you know, that kind of money and wait around for something that I'm doing? That's ridiculous. What is wrong with these people? That's awesome. Um, That's awesome. And, you know, I, again, I it's like, I'm so grateful for it and I appreciate it so much, but I'm like, come on, man. You know, there, there are artists who, you know, who were around in like the twenties and thirties who I grew up like idolizing and loving who are, you know, on top of the mountain and I'm at base camp, you know, and you can get their work for that money, you know, go get their work. <laughs> it's a, Very strange. That's funny. Hey, this is the last thing I'll ask you about. Um, uh, Obviously, your journey has been phenomenal. I encourage anyone to look up not only your website, just the work that you do. It, it, it is really, really amazing stuff. Baseball and these types of kind of creative journeys have taken you to, to just un, like unimaginably cool places. We talked about, you know, having message exchanges with uh, the likes of Chuck D. Who, who's the person? Who's the person that you met that you were like, I, I can't believe like I, either art or baseball or whatever is taking me. I can't believe I'm meeting this person or in this room. That's a good question. Uh, so baseball wise, baseball wise, there haven't been many. I mean, I met, you know, I met a, 
a couple of people here and there, like meeting uh, meeting Bob Feller, Yogi Berra. That was, you know, those were really cool. Yeah, th- but... those are not those are not afterthoughts. Those are awesome. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Life, no, life, they're, life, life. <laughs> they're they're awesome, but <laughs> but for me, like, I'm not I'm not uh, necessarily like starstruck by them. But if I meet an artist that you know that I admire, like there's there's this one artist uh, also named Greg, not spelled funny like mine. But he's, he's an illustrator. He's, a, uh, he's got to be about 20 years older than me, Greg Manches, who is, love his work. I've loved it for years. And it just so happens that we used to use uh, the same photographer uh, to, you know, to, shoot our, to shoot our work. And I went in to drop off a painting one day and he was there and I met him and I'm like, I feel like I'm meeting the Pope. I don't even know what to say to you. <laughs> I, I, that's awesome. I'm just, it, it's like, you know, it's like when you meet someone you're so starstruck by and you can't look at them in the eye, you're like looking down at your feet. Like, that's what it was like. <laughs> did you, uh, did, did he know who you were? Did he, like, did he know yourself? He, he, I think he knew me, like, not, not necessarily because of my work, but I think he knew me because I would have stuff at the same, you know, sure, at sure, the photographers yeah, yeah. when yeah, he would yeah. drop stuff off. But he complimented me. We actually got to like hang out once or twice. Oh, that's cool. And you know, it's like uh, I'm like I can't believe I'm hanging out with this guy. Like <laughs> I can't believe he actually. I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I think he might kind of consider me almost like a peer, sort of. Oh, sure. Which I'm like that blows my mind. <laughs> Oh, it blows my mind hearing you tell the story because it's like most people that are familiar with your work would be like, "You're killing, you're killing, you're kidding me right now." No, man, it's true. I mean, hilarious. The problem is, you know, you know that uh, uh, have you seen Ken Burns' uh, baseball documentary? Yes, yes. Okay, so in the first inning, the first uh, episode, like within the first five minutes, uh, the the narrator says something to the effect of like baseball's a haunted game where uh where everybody is measured uh up against everyone who has gone before them or something like that sure uh and that's the way i feel with with painting i mean even though it's not a competitive thing but you know if i'm doing a painting of somebody i'm thinking of how you know how these older artists would handle it and if i finish a work I'm like, oh, you know, okay, I solved that visual problem, but it's not a John Singer Sargent, you know, it's not a Norman Rockwell, it's not, mm. it's not where it should be, uh, or where I'd like it to be. Uh, so, yeah, when I get to meet someone whose work, uh, you know, it, it, it puts me in that place, it's like, oh my god, that's... Like that's, and that's that's amazing. and that's fitting. That's fitting for baseball because, like you, you mentioned, the documentary. The one that stands out to me is I think I think it was uh, the HBO uh, um, sixty four uh, movie. There's the HBO movie that did the mantle Roger Maris chase. Oh, the sixty one, yeah, sixty one. Excuse me, I'm sorry, sixty one. And there was a uh, there's a scene in there where like Mantle's like. Yeah, we're just chasing, like, we're basically chasing ghosts. Because, yeah. like, no matter what we do, like, Babe Ruth's still going to be, like, cooler than us. So it's like, yeah. you know, he said it in much more colorful terms in the film. But it, it is one of, it's the only sport uh, that the legends really do have these mythical, it has a mythical aura where it's like, you're not going to be better, no matter how great you are today, you're not right. going to be better than right. the mazes and the errands and the mantles of the world. And you know, you can compare that to something like uh, to today. There's a legitimate debate, and I think rightfully so, in regards to like is LeBron James and Michael Jordan like. And then there's usually most most people would be like LeBron James and Michael Jordan, and then everyone else. Like there's a bunch of other folks. And baseball, you could be <laughs> you could be the greatest, and somebody's gonna be like, well, he, he's no he's no Willie Mays, right? Like, he's no Hank Aaron. Like I don't Absolutely. care what he does. I don't care Absolutely. what Mike Trout does. He's not going to be this guy. Yeah. And, but, <laughs> don't, but don't you feel like, do you ever feel like you have that bias too? Like, so like talking it's, about like music, let's say, you know, if we're talking about like hip hop, right? So, you know, 
I grew up like listening to to the tribe called Quest, and sure. it's like anything that I listen to now that's like in that realm. I'm like, this is this isn't even close. I mean, <laughs> so so here's the thing: I am on record repeatedly winning or losing fights that I actually do say Jay Z is the greatest. Of okay. All the time. Okay. And so, and, and and obviously Jay Z's over fifty now, but he's his body of work through any metric. So, and this is it goes back to baseball as well. There's a, a hip hop producer out of North Carolina, uh, Ninth Wonder, who's extremely. Uh, he he teaches at Duke. He I mean he's a academic and a professor. He's gone to Harvard, and the best thing he said about music when he was talking to to students, he was like, "Okay, we're going to treat this like the Hall of Fame." What are the metrics? What are the, the base hits, RBS, home runs, and so forth that you would put to put somebody in the Hall of Fame? And they would, mm-hmm. they run out all these stats, like, uh, you know, record sales, this, this, you know, street credibility and so forth. And at the end of the day, he's like, okay, let's look, let's, let's look at this. Jay-Z, 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 <laughs> Jay-Z, Jay-Z. And it was like, and so in many ways, it was like, and, and, and even today, today, it's like, he's the Beatles. Right. Like Jay Z right. is like, you, you just can't top them. Now, the difference is um, when you're talking about different things, careers cut short and, and music careers get cut short, you know, right. so much faster than, than baseball. There's like, you know, when you think about real careers that got cut short, Clemente comes to mind. Right. Right. But right. like, you, we, we in, in hip hop, we have a Tupac, we have a Biggie, we have so many folks that, uh, you know, ODB and, and Wu Tang, they're just like these rockets that literally, uh, Notorious B.I.G. had two albums. Right. That's it. That's right. it. And, and while he's living, Tupac only had a handful of albums. Everything else is post-reproducted right. and put together. So, yeah, uh, I don't do... Now, here's the thing with baseball. Uh, because of reading and stuff like that, I'm a Maze Aaron guy, and mm. I've never seen them play. <laughs> never seen them put on a cloth. <laughs> like, I mean, I've seen clips, you know what I mean? I've seen video, and I've looked at the numbers and so forth. But I read, uh, I was a maze guy and still I'm a maze guy. Uh, but I read Howard Bryan's book about Henry Aaron and the way that other, his contemporaries talked about it, even he, you know, any recent passing and some of the Aaron stuff that they've talked about. Like, I think it was either Bob Gibson or Sandy Koufax was like, yeah, we're not like, we can't, I think it was Koufax, like, we can't pitch inside him. So it's like, he's like, so you just could imagine me and my friends were sitting around talking about this. And he's like, could you imagine in today's like game, like, you know, the best pitcher in the world, Kershaw or somebody being like, yeah, there's a whole half of a plate you couldn't throw today. Yeah. <laughs> you just, just turn it around. Yeah. So it, it, it's amazing. It's a, it, it is phenomenal. And, and uh, so is your work. I will close it out with this because you've been very generous with your time. I really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Um, where can people it, like there's <laughs> you just said there's a five, five year waiting list so good <laughs> luck but where can people find and see and kind of follow your work um, especially on like i think i i look at it on twitter and instagram but where do people find your stuff yeah i, I mean i think i think on social media it's probably uh more up to date than say like my website but if you if you do a search on uh, Twitter or Facebook or Instagram under my name uh, Greg Kreinler, you'll find me. Uh, even even if you spell my name wrong, you'll probably find me. Uh, sure, I have. Yeah, <laughs> sure, well, I have. It's all good. Um, but yeah, I mean, I I guess I can be found, um, but which no. I'm but so no. grateful for. <laughs> Look, uh, we're going to have to leave it there, ladies and gentlemen. Please make sure you check out, uh, check out all the work. It is amazing. I'll put a link up uh, at the end of this podcast where you can find it. And once again, thanks so much for the time. This is the Cheats Movement podcast. And uh, until next time, we see it. <laughs>